Thank you very much. Um, exciting times. I mean, those of us who are um, um, interested in the Arab world, those of us who are interested in, in the uh, phenomenon of strategic nonviolent action, uh, it's, um, I, uh, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, in many ways, it, it, I, I, I can think about uh, what it must be like, have been like to have been an Eastern European specialist in 1989 and see the you know, dramatic changes you know, going on there. And, uh, and it's funny because back, um, back in December, after the even more fraudulent than usual um, Egyptian parliamentary election, I, I had an I, I wrote an article in, in which I, I said that um, I, I noted the the growth of civil society in Egypt, and I said that you know, Egypt may very well be the next country to have a Serbian Filipino style uh, people power uh, pro democracy uh, revolution. I was wrong, of course. The Tunisians beat them to it, but um, nevertheless, even though I um, I, I, I was, was, was not that surprised to see what transpired. It's still, I'm still dumbstruck you know, by, the, uh, by the phenomenon. We're, we're really looking at a, a, um, um, a new era in, in so many respects. But in certain ways, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, the, in a sense that during the past 20, 30 years, we have seen unarmed insurrections um, overthrow autocratic regimes in, in countries ranging from the Philippines to Poland, uh, from you know, Chile to Serbia, uh, you know, and, 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 and some countries that a lot of uh, Americans hadn't heard of, like Maldives and Mali. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and, and I want to look at the changes in the um, in the Middle East, you know, with you know, from you know, from from this this context of, of what what are we t we talking about? But I also want to emphasize this is not a totally new phenomenon in the um, um, in the Middle East uh, either. Uh, I mean, uh, Egypt itself, of course, uh, received its independence or sort of independence <laughs> from uh, Britain uh, in 1922 as as a result of a series of, of, of strikes and civil disobedience and mass actions beginning in 1919. Uh, if you look at Iran, you can go back even earlier, the tobacco strike in the 1890s, the Constitutional Revolution in 1906, uh, the overthrow of the Shah, you know, of course, uh, uh, didn't start with the, uh, the uh, tragically aborted Green Revolution of a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, we have uh, you know, seen the Cedar Revolution in, in, in uh, Lebanon, uh, which um, uh, out, um, led to the withdrawal of... Um, of Syrian forces from Lebanon and their domination of the uh, Lebanese uh, uh, government. Uh, you know, there's been the, um, uh, in both 1964 and 1985, uh, dictators were overthrown in Sudan through uh, unarmed uh, insurrections. Uh, these were tra tragically cut short in uh, you know, military coups a few years later, but in the interim period, you know, Sudan had one of the more democratic uh, 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 government, uh, governments in the, um, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, you know, the first Palestinian Intifada uh, obviously had a, had a very strong uh, nonviolent action component, um, but you can even go back to the general strike of, of the 1930s to, to see the, um, um, the, the precedent there. Uh, in, in Western Sahara, uh, there has been an um, ongoing uh, uh, what they call uh, uh, Intifada Iskatlal, uh, Intifada for Independence uh, uh, against the uh, Moroccan occupation. And in fact, uh, just um, you know, uh, six weeks uh, before the um, uprising in, in uh, Tunisia, uh, you had uh, the Sahrawis brought together a massive tent city of up to 20,000 people just outside of Alioun, uh, which was violently you know, broken up in a uh, pretty, uh, pretty impressive crackdown by, um, by Moroccan, uh, Moroccan forces. And 20,000 people in Western Sahara is, uh, in terms of overall population, is, is about as big as a million people in Egypt. Uh, the, um, and and you know, there is, there's, um, when you, you know, think about, uh, uh, you know, despite the stereotype a lot of people here in the West, you know, have of, um, of Islam, you know, which ranges from this, 
you know, blind obedience uh, to, to authority, you know, these people are somehow like, you know, that, that, uh, that you know, they're not, not capable of independent democratic decision making to the other extreme of being fanatic, you know, terrorists that uh, will attack any kind of authority. In fact, you know, there's a pretty rich, rich history when, when, um, in, in Islamic culture about the, 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 the implied you know, social contract between the, the rule and rule, you know, the idea that, you know, if you don't, um, that uh, you know, we, we see in, in the Hadith, we see from some of the early uh, ca uh, um, caliphs, you see in, 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 um, uh, among um, Islamic scholars you know, for years that you do not owe your obedience to illegitimate authority. And uh, refusing to obey illegitimate authority is the real cornerstone of, of strategic uh, nonviolent action. And uh, since w w what we're talking, uh, what we're, we're um, so we're not talking about pacifism. We're not talking about nonviolence as an as an ethic. If you look at nonviolent struggles in the Middle East and elsewhere, you you, you don't see people engaged in nonviolent action. You know, uh, um, you know. You know, out of, of a spiritual or, or ethical perspective, with a few notable exceptions. Obviously, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and the movements, they, the, the, uh, Gandhi and King were exceptional because they were both uh, you know, brilliant uh, political strategists, but also were um, you know, committed pacifists. But there, there are many ways the, um, you know, the exception. Um, that I, and I think in, in virtually all these movements, if they felt they could be victorious uh, uh, quicker and easier using armed struggle, they, they would have done so. But uh, they recognize that the, uh, the, the power of nonviolent action is that essentially you are choosing you know, a different weapons system uh, than, than your opponent, that you're using the ultimate kind of asymmetrical warfare, that uh, by using military force, you are essentially um, meeting the opponent at its strongest point. Um, that uh, using nonviolent action, you are, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're basically, uh, you, know, um, you have a much better uh, chance of winning defections from police and military, you know, for the obvious reason that the people are much more likely to shoot at people who are shooting at them <laughs> than the, the people who are completely nonviolent. You're much more likely to get divisions within the um, uh, ruling elites. Uh, because a nonviolent movement is less scary in terms of what's going to happen to you if you lose <laughs> than, uh, than an armed struggle. And also there are key segments of society you know, that you know, may not like the regime but are a little nervous about the opposition and they may believe some of the propaganda about the opposition. But again, if they're using a uh, you know, nonviolent uh, you know, struggle and they see the regime being repressive against them, obviously the sympathy will tilt you know, more and more you know, towards the opponents. Um, uh, Gene Sharp, who's you know, uh, arguably the leading theorist in this whole phenomenon, has referred to it as political jujitsu. Aikido might be a more accurate analogy, but you know, basically using the weight of the opponent um, uh, against them. And um, <clears throat> and I think if we, we kind of under, understand this, you know, part, this side, and we understand some of the things that you know, led up you know, to these uh, the, the, this uh, this. Um, uh, you know, uh, these um, movements that we are you know, we've, we're seeing um, unfold, uh, we can get away from what, what the trend I've seen in some places where um, you know people seem to uh, be willing to credit everybody but the people themselves who <laughs> who, who did it. Um, that you know who if you, who is responsible for the Tunisian and Egyptian uh, you know, uh, revolutions. I would argue it's the millions of ordinary Tunisians and Egyptians. Um, you know, men and women, Christian and Muslim, young and old, workers and intellectuals, poor and middle class, secular and religious, you know, the, the people who face down the truncheons, the, 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 the tear gas, the water can, uh, cannons, the bullets, uh, the, the uh, goon squads, uh, you know, for, their, for their freedom. Um, and uh, it was not the military you know, that was responsible for the downfall of uh, Ben Ali and, and Mubarak. It was um, I, and, and I was uh, asked about uh, Egypt the other day, and I said it was more of a, a coup de grace than a coup d'état. <laughs> that you know the military maybe has been the backbone of these uh, regimes. You know they did not. Um, um, uh, you know they, they were quite happy you know, sticking it out, but the people on the streets uh, didn't give uh, give a choice. So let, let me talk about uh, Egypt a little bit. Um, 
Uh, when some top military officers eased uh, Mubarak aside on, 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 on February 11th, it was because, uh, you know, clearly watching the reaction from uh, Mubarak's non-resignation speech the day before, that they were going to be swept out with him <laughs> unless they were willing to, um, to move. And, and their refusal to engage in a Tiananmen Square t uh, style massacre um, it's not because the generals were on the protesters' side, and, and not because Mubarak was a, a really nice humanitarian who would never do something, thing, something like that, but because they couldn't trust their own, own soldiers who were um, disproportionately from poor and disenfranchised sectors of society. Um, uh, you know, that would, very, would not likely obey orders to, um, uh, to shoot into the crowd. And similarly, Ben Ali uh, fled uh, Tunisia, not because the military ordered him to, when, he, when they told him that they would be unable to uh, carry out his orders to shoot into the hundreds of thousands of people to find curfew orders and, and, uh, and, and uh, occupying uh, you know, Bogriba uh, Avenue and, and, and Tunis. I, I also want to emphasize that it was not, not only was it not the military, it was not the United States. <laughs> you know, along the primary backer of uh, Mubarak and, and a major supporter of the uh, Ben Ali regime, uh, the Obama administration uh, was playing catch up for uh, most of the um, most of these uprisings. In the case of Egypt, to, to Obama's credit, he did push for an end to attacks on protesters and, and uh, spoke out against shutting down the internet and reportedly threatened to cut off um, military and strategic cooperation if uh, U.S. weapons were used in a massacre of protesters. But well, though, though he, he eventually called for a speedy transition for democracy, he never called for Mubarak to, to step, or Ben Ali to step down. Um, his strongest and most eloquent words for the pro-democracy struggles in those countries were only after the uh, dictators uh, left, uh, giving a sense that it came more from a desire to not be on the wrong side of history than on uh, any uh, great desire to play the role of... Um, of catalyst. Indeed, in the early days of the uprisings, uh, we heard you know, people like uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton and Vice President Biden um, you know, defending the regimes and most calling for unspecified reforms within the system. I remember Clinton's first comments about Tunisia was that, oh, they need to liberalize their economy more, even though you know, Tunisia was already uh, the country that had fall uh, followed uh, IMF edicts uh, more than you know, probably any other country. Uh, in the region, and it was the um, exacerbating inequalities or one of the things that was uh, um, uh, uh, you know, causing some uh, was, was you know, leading many people out on the um, on on the uh, streets, and similarly the calls for restraint on both sides you know fell <laughs> it didn't didn't really inspire you know, um, you know many people given the disproportionate amount of violence you know by um, you know, by the regime, you know, relative to the, um, uh, the, the, the relatively minor uh, acts of, you know, of, of violence, rioting and uh, stone throwing, and a couple of police stations, torch, that kind of thing. Um, the, um, and I think, it, I think these, the, the, the shifts in, in U.S. policy is, is really interesting because you know, those of you who spent time in the Middle East have you know, probably picked on this, up, up the sense of fatalism, you know, that the... Um, um, uh, that ultimately Washington will impact what happens in, in, their, in their country, but, but here we see ordinary people uh, engaging in the kind of actions that's really impacted uh, Washington's, uh, Washington's uh, um, um, uh, policies. Uh, the, and and the, so this, this, this shift, uh, if tepid, if belated, if not enough, <laughs> Uh, of, of support for these movements uh, by the administration um, is, is long overdue. Uh, though the Obama administration rejected the dangerous neoconservative ideology of its predecessor, in many ways they had fallen back on the realpolitik of previous administrations and continuing to support uh, repressive regimes through unconditional arms transfers and, and um, other security systems. And, Indeed, Obama's understandable skepticism of the whole uh, you know, neoconservative doctrine of externally mandated top-down approaches to democratization through regime change ended up turning into an excuse for 
you know, further arming these regimes, which then used these instruments of repression to subjugate you know, popular indigenous bottom-up uh, struggles for democratization. At the same time, there was a subtle but I think important shift in um, the U.S. government's discourse on human rights um, when Obama came to office a little over two years ago. Um, but, you know, the Bush administration pushed, uh, to, to what extent they did uh, support uh, democracy, which is pretty limited and, and selective. You know, I remember him talking, you know, Bush talking about spreading democracy from Damascus to Tehran. And while I'm sure we all agree that Syria and Iran could use more democracy, he tended not to talk about Tunis or Cairo or much less Riyadh and uh, Manama and other, other capitals. But um, to the extent that, that the Bush administration did talk about democratization, it was um, a rather superficial structuralist view. I mean, it pushed, up, pushed elections, you know, which of course could be easily um, manipulated. And he actually had them praise the elections in Yemen and and. Uh, um, and, and Egypt, and even those very limited city council uh, uh, elections in Saudi Arabia, or, for, um, or whatever, as, as proof of the great democratic transformation that they supposedly saw happening as a result of our invasion of Iraq. Um, but um, Obama's taken more of an agency view of human rights, and that, that there, there has been more of an emphasis on uh, freedom of expression, right to protest. Um, a recognition that human rights reform can only come from below and, and, and not imposed uh, from above. And so even though I've been, I've been pretty you know, um, critical that the Obama administration has not been stronger in its support for these, these, uh, these movements, that uh, um, I, 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 I do think that this, um, that, that, you know, perhaps with his background as a community organizer or whatever, that he does have a greater appreciation of the, the power of change coming from below. Indeed, there are indications that the White House has been far more sympathetic to these popular movements than, say, the State Department, Defense Department, uh, uh, which is one reason we've seen occasionally um, seemingly contradictory uh, statements coming out of the um, um, administration. Um, but uh, I th uh, to, to get back to, to my, my main point, I think that the, um, it, it's, what we're seeing is a reminder of where power actually comes from. That even if a government has a monopoly of military force, even if a government has the support of the world's one remaining superpower, it is still ultimately powerless if people refuse to recognize uh, its authority through general strikes, through filling the streets, mass refusal to obey official orders, and other forms of nonviolent um, um, uh, resistance, even the most autocratic regimes um, uh, cannot survive. And uh, I, 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 should also, um, um, I, I should also mention that uh, as much as I, I support and as much as I'm excited about nonviolent struggle uh, in the Middle East, I think as long as the uh, United States remains the world's number one um, political and uh, or diplomatic, um, economic, and military backer of Middle Eastern dictatorships, you know, perhaps the place that needs nonviolent action the most is here to, to, uh, to challenge uh, um, U.S. policy in, in this regard. Uh, there's been some talk about the role that some U.S. embassy staffers had with in terms of sporadic contacts with uh, pro-democracy groups in, in Egypt and elsewhere through um, uh, congressionally funded foundations like the National Endowment for Democracy. And you know, there's some limited assistance to um, civil society organizations. But um, this, you know, most of the NED type funding that we, we um, um, uh, saw was, um, I mean, went to more elite uh, um, opposition groups. It wasn't the kind of thing that engaged in, the, in, in training for strategic nonviolent action, some of the grassroots kinds of efforts that ultimately really made the difference. I mean, it's interesting that there are some people who are trying to credit the, or blame, depending on, your, on their perspective, uh, this, the, this kind of um, you know, limited uh, assistance. But um, certainly compared to the billions of dollars worth of security assistance uh, provided the regime, um, you know, this limited amount of, 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 of funding I didn't, um, I don't think was, uh, was particularly um, um, uh, critical. I, I also think that the, um, 
the it's been a little little um, too much emphasis on the role of the um, of the internet and social media and that kind of thing. I mean, and obviously it's it's. It played an important role in exposing some of the abuses of the respective regimes. I think it was important in terms of um, of getting around censorship. I think it was and 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 it was certainly important to some degree in terms of a, a tactical coordination. But it's also important to note that less than 15 percent of Egyptian the Egyptian population had access to the internet. And most of that was through internet ca cafes that are often policed, you know, pretty heavily. Uh, by uh, 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 agents uh, uh, of the regime. And we know that for at least five days there was no internet at all, which is the time when the movement grew the most. In fact, it was some, in fact, in fact some people argue that it was spurred on in part because of people's resentment of the regime shutting down the internet. Not to mention the phenomenon in Cairo when people couldn't follow what was going on on the internet, they, want, they decided to go outside and check it out themselves. <laughs> Or, 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 or find their relatives or whatever, and, uh, and it made it grow um, even more. Um, but, you know, and, and then while, again, it's a very, very useful tool, let's remember that, you know, there are most of the, these popular uh, nonviolent uh, you know, revolutions that have swept you know, various parts of the world, you know, such as 1989 Eastern Europe, um, happened before, you know, there was, there was an uh, internet. And, you know, because when, when people feel a need to communicate, they will find a way to communicate. Um, you know, whether it be through leafleting or through or through other other actions. In fact, when the uh, during the first intifada, when the Israelis had 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 uh, you know roadblocks everywhere, they were wondering why the same leaflets or or at least the same wording of the leaflets seemed to come out in in different different cities. And apparently, you had people who had literally memorized. Sections of the, the leaders and uh, uh, leaflets and the orders from the, um, uh, uh, the, the the command of the resistance memorize them and then they'd go and they would you know, write it down in the new <laughs> different town and things would get around that way. In Mali, you know, when they had the uprising against Traore dictatorship in 1991, and Mali, as you may know, is one of the poorest countries uh, on the planet, very little in the way of infrastructure. Uh, their pro-democracy movement got the word out using griots. You know the traditional sing-songy uh, storytellers. So, 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 um, so again, the, the the internet, Facebook, social media, uh, Twitter. I mean, they, they it it uh, was a very you know, it was a very useful tool to be sure. But you know, let's I, I um, let's be careful before we say it caused the revolution or calling it the Facebook revolution or 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 anything like um, anything like that. Um, and also. For the WikiLeaks, I mean that, you know, while certain leak tables exposed how U.S. diplomats were well aware of the corruption and repression of their respective regimes and their propensity to deliberately exaggerate the influence of radical Islamists among the opposition, such malfeasance by their government was certainly nothing new to the citizens of these countries. I mean, they knew, <laughs> they knew about this already. They didn't need you know, WikiLeaks to uh, to to tell them. Um, and another thing, I, I mean, there's also been some stories about uh, um, the you know, assistance and, and, and training by outsiders in strategic nonviolent action. Now, there were a couple seminars organized by Egyptian pro-democracy groups that brought in veterans of popular unarmed insurrections, uh, people from Serbia, from South Africa, from Palestine, and in other countries, along with Western academics who have studied this uh, phenomenon. Um, but these seminars focused on generic information about the history and dynamics of strategic uh, nonviolent action. These were not, as some in the media reported, workshops on how to overthrow Mubarak. Um, neither the foreign speakers nor their affiliated institutions provided any training, advice, money, or anything tangible to the a small number of Egyptian activists who attended. Uh, I was one of the academics who lectured at one of these seminars. Uh, and it was held at the In Khaldun Center uh, in, in Cairo. Um, and, and, I, and I could vouch that the Egyptians present were already very knowledgeable and sophisticated in terms of their strategic thinking about their struggle. 
Um, and I, none of us foreigners can, can take credit for, um, uh, for what uh, you know, later transpired. Um, I'm all for international solidarity. <laughs> And you know, if there's some useful tools to share, great, just like um, appropriate technologies, if you're into development issues, things like that. It, 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 I mean, in capacity building things, I mean, there's, there's some positive things about that. But um, you know, there, there's a, there's a, um, there's a uh, in many ways, uh, the, this, um, it's a, uh, you know, um, I don't want to fall in, uh, I, ne neither us nor the Serbs, any of these people are some kind of Lawrence of Arabia types, you know, that came in and, <laughs> and to somehow, you know, the, 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 the white folks, you know, coming in to uplift the, the natives and, and, and that kind of thing. Again, I just really want to emphasize that it's just critical, you know, not to deny agency to the, the people who really you know, put the risk, who, who, who had the, um, whose freedom was at stake uh, during, during all this. Um, now the um, <clears throat> what I want, as, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, there, there has in many ways what transpired in, in, in Egypt and what we're seeing in some of these other countries are not total surprises because what we've seen in Egypt and elsewhere has been this real dramatic growth of, of civil society um, um, uh, movements. Um, the increased government repression, the, the, the worsening economic con conditions. Um, there's a, um, um, there are a combination of things that, uh, that really, that, 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 that came together that, 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 uh, that made uh, this, uh, this movement um, you know, possible. And what's exciting about it, you know, f for me is, is that it, it, chal it, it uh, you know, challenged, uh, the, the um, both extremes of how this kind of change, uh, how, how change takes place, how dictatorships can be overthrown. And I'm the first to acknowledge that, that in Tunisia and in Egypt, there's still a long way to go before we have real democracy. Um, and, you know, there are, of course, these ongoing, or ongoing struggles. But uh, we're on the way there. And I can talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what, are the, what I think are the chances of a more total democratic transformation, what some of the obstacles might be and the like. But... Um, but, but, but for now, just let me say that the, um, these uprisings really ha have struck a blow um, to Al-Qaeda's whole thesis that the only way to, to overthrow these U.S.-backed dictatorships uh, is through joining their kind of movement, of this, of this uh, you know, uh, cultish, uh, reactionary uh, um, uh, uh, misinterpretation of Islam and the use of terror. And let's remember that Al-Qaeda originally got its start um, as a movement fighting these U.S.-backed dictatorships. I mean, the first Al-Qaeda attack really was um, at Kobar Towers in Riyadh, where they, 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 uh, they, they attacked a, um, a residential compound for U.S. Uh, you know, um, servicemen who were training the uh, Saudi National Guard, which is largely used for internal repression. Despite this and everything else, uh, they, they never came close to overthrowing any um, any um, um, Arab governments. On the other extreme, you think of the, the neo neoconservatives and their supporters who said, you know, the only way to bring uh, democracy to the Arab world is through, through foreign invasion, <laughs> you know, such as the uh, um, invasion occupation of, of, of Iraq. And of course, we, we, uh, we, we've seen how disastrous uh, that, that has been. Um, you know, Iraq today, you know, you... Um, they're gunning down pro-democracy <laughs> demonstrators and closing their offices and, and uh, rounding up uh, journalists and academics and other intellectuals who support these, uh, these movements, not to mention the torture chambers, the death squads, uh, you know, uh, everything else that has been uh, you know, transpired, and, which in many ways is, is um, what happens when you uh, try to um, um, uh, <clears throat> Impose so-called democracy you know, through a um, uh, through through foreign um, invasion, but you know basically you know what the people of Egypt and Tunisia have done, and what we you know, what we're seeing elsewhere is that uh, that both these violent militaristic um, ideologies are wrong. That for change to take place in the Middle East, North Africa, it's not going to come from armed struggle. It's not going to come from foreign intervention. It's not going to come from sanctimonious statements from Washington. It's going to come from the people themselves.
Um, and <clears throat> there's been uh, it was interesting. The Freedom House, which is a you know pretty establishment type group uh, in a lot of ways, you know they 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 did an empirical survey a couple of years ago where they looked at seventy transitions from uh, dictatorship to uh, democracy in the past twenty thirty years, and they found that um, the overwhelming majority of cases were not from foreign invasion, not from top down elite driven reforms, you know, not from um, armed struggle. You know, there are a few examples of the latter two, but you know, the, nearly three quarters of them came from democratic civil society organizations engaged in uh, strategic and uh, nonviolent uh, struggle. A different study published in 2007 in uh, International Security, which as many of you know is a very you know, mainstream um, international security journal. I think it might be included in that packet on, on the table. Um, they looked at 323 major insurrections in support of self-determination and democratic rule since uh, 1900, and they found that violent resistance was successful only 26% of the time, whereas nonviolent campaigns had a 53% um, rate of success, and in other words, tw twice or, or twice as much. And so, from the you know, from the poorest countries in Africa to relatively affluent countries in Eastern Europe from communist regimes to right-wing dictatorships, across the cultural, geographic, and ideological spectrum, democratic and progressive forces have recognized the power of nonviolent action to free them from oppression. And again, this is not, doesn't come from a moral or spiritual commitment to nonviolence per se, but simply because it works. And we've reached a threshold where we're seeing this take hold in the Middle East and North Africa to an unprecedented degree. Um, there are copies that I, I, in fact, I have, in addition to the ones left on the table, I have more here that we're able to give out for free if you're interested. This book is Civilian Jihad, Nonviolent Struggle, Democratization, and Governance in the Middle East. Uh, it was published about a year ago. And it, it, it gets, it's a phenomenon that uh, this, is not, this is not new. Uh, this kind of thing has been um, um, building uh, for some time. Often when we, we don't know that these things are happening until there's... Um, you know, it's suddenly on the on the TV screens, and you you know see the hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. But you know, as with Serbia and you know, Chile, Philippines, you know, Czechoslovakia, you know, other things, these are uh, you know it was really a culmination of things that have been going on for um, you know, for years. So I, I'm I'm happy to talk about some of the specifics of, of Tunisia and Egypt, with some of the ongoing struggles if people are interested, as well as as, as broader things about the, the history and dynamics of nonviolent action in general. But why don't I stop stop my uh, prepared uh, remarks here and then open it up for uh, any any um, uh, you know questions or input that, that people have. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll get out some additional books to pass around. Refer to my question I asked you before the talk began. If your center gets into identity studies, um, maybe you'd have to be a prophet, maybe it's not fair to ask you this, but do you see five years down the road that the um, independence movements uh, in the Middle East will lead to greater identification towards pan-Islamic tendencies in the area of pan-Arab or state nationalism or a combination? That one will be strengthened more than another. Um, there, there's been a, a, a there's, there hasn't been much of a visible Islamist uh, component uh, in, in, in most of these um, most of these uprisings. Uh, you know, they, they um, and particularly in Egypt, we notice how you had had uh, Christians and Muslims together, emphasizing emphasizing that that aspect. Um, I, I think we we are in, in certain ways. There's you could say there's a there's a Kind of bottom-up pan-Arabism uh, in, in in some of these cases. I remember, you know, some of the uh, Egyptian slogans were actually, um, you know, um, uh, using more uh, Arabic's closer you didn't find, you find in Tunisia than you would in Egypt, actually, because it was a successful slogan in Tunisia. You, you notice a lot of you know net, networking. Um, it, it's in many ways again to use the the broader um, you know movement. Uh, it's what some people call globalization from below, as distinct from the uh, globalization from above, the more neoliberal uh, model with the international financial institution, the globalization from uh, below, the 
networking of civil society groups, environmentalists, human rights, and uh, women's groups, and you know, others. And, we, and I think we're through the um, through new communication technologies and, and others. There's definitely a, 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 um, um, a growth in, um, in in communication uh, with with, uh, with people. In, in, in Libya, the de uh, de degree of us of um, uh, support just in terms of you know medical aid and humanitarian assistance from other Arab countries has been been quite impressive to the two places on the border where people are trying to flee and, and elsewhere um, so I, I mean I think I could I, I, I do see greater international cooperation in terms of um, and and uh, you know a sense of Arab identity you know from from being people from people kind of in, in a common common struggle. But I think for now it's it's just a um, uh, it, it, it's it's more just a phenomenon of basic of, you know political freedom and and economic and social justice you know rather than one that has has a has, has a stronger you know, um, identity in terms of um, uh, religion ethnicity or or, or that that kind of thing. Second question. Um, uh, so. Uh, from a comparative political perspective and, and thinking in terms of like resource mobilization and like political opportunity, what do you think was the most significant factor in the, in making these movements successful? Um, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, had to do with this uh, this growth of civil society that, that people not being able to trust or rely upon state institutions uh, that uh, they you know they, they, they forming their own kinds of uh, of, of organizations uh, the kind of you know the um, uh, and in the sense of, of of empowerment that that came from from that um, I think we and I want to just talk a little more about the economic issue I mean and the the combination of um, Liberalizing the economy without liberalizing the politics is, is a kind of bad combination, because it tends to exacerbate social inequality. And when you when the state sells off public um, um, industries and assets and things like that, rather than make the economy more efficient, it just goes into cronies and <laughs> other backers of the regime. So you kind of have the worst of both systems in terms of uh, the inequality and inefficiency and and and, and the like. And that was certainly, um, you know, um, uh, you know, pressing, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 pressing people. Uh, I think in some cases it was just, uh, you know, very smart, um, tactical, and and strategic you know, thinking. Uh, it sounds like the, you know, no one was more surprised than numbers that came out on um, January twenty fourth than the Egyptians themselves. Um, Instead of seeing the same few hundred or a couple thousand people that had come out previously, you know the the the, the numbers that they were 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 much larger, and part of it has to do with the way they were able to communicate people to come in from different directions at, at the same time, you know, gathering at different points. I mean, there's some. We're, I mean, I, I, every almost every day I hear new stories about whoa, you know, that was pretty smart. <laughs> that. Um, um, and so, I, and 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 I think there there's there's, you know, the whole question of praxis is one of the most fascinating, uh, you know, um, where where does it reach that point where people are are no longer afraid, you know, where, when people uh, um, that combination of, of, of hope for a better future and desperation not <laughs> not being able to take it anymore, you know, comes together. Uh, in that in that critical mass where people really feel like they can make make a uh, make a difference. Uh, Osama, thanks for your talk, Professor. Um, if I may ask you a question about Libya, and mm -hmm. specifically if you're looking at nonviolent action as having specific advantages, then um, you know, how does the Libyan, what sort of precedent is the Libyan case setting, well, and, and why is the United States not necessarily? Learning, it seems, from Tunisia, Libya, when it's dealing now with Bahrain, Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the big disconnect there? Well, in Libya, I mean, it's it's. You know, I mean, the, the, traditionally, you know, the argument has been that Rantier states are going to be are very difficult to challenge through uh, 
through uh, popular um, civil insurrections because one of the power of civil insurrections is, is governments are ultimately dependent on the people for their cooperation. But if they're more dependent on, on um, money from their natural resources than they are taxes or, or labor or whatever, you know, they, they seem to have you know, a lot of more, you know, a lot, um, they're, in, they're in a stronger position in dealing with these kinds of things. Um, and of course, you know, Libya compared to Tunisia and Egypt and some of these, and, and uh, e even Bahrain you know, has a pretty weak uh, civil society. And I, you know, I think that those factors have more to do with the fact that it's disintegrated into violence than the uh, mercur mercurial or repressive nature of, of uh, Gaddafi and, and his regime. Because we've seen plenty, of, you know, we've seen very oppressive regimes that were still overthrown from, from you know, Nonviolent action. I mean, Saharto he had more blood on his hands than probably anybody in, in recent uh, decades. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's noteworthy that the um, movement in Tunisia, I'm uh, sorry, movement in Libya had their greatest gains when they were largely nonviolent. That's when they you know, liberated half the country and you had all these defections of, of ambassadors and, 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 and military people and even some top uh, Gaddafi aides and, and that, but, but in, in taking up arms, they're essentially um, meeting the regime where it's, where it's quite strongest, or strongest. Um, the explicit calls for uh, you know, Gaddafi to resign you know, combined with you know, consideration of a no-fly zone or other assistance uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to the rebels does contrast you know, very, uh, very much with, with Bahrain, but in many ways it's not surprising. There's always been certain double standards between um, um, dictators we like and dictators we don't like. Uh, in Bahrain, of course, uh, you know, I think there's some people who fall into the whole Iranian boogeyman uh, argument. I, from what I know about Bahrain, that's not the case, that this is a genuine, as, as authentic and genuine a pro-democracy movement as we've, we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt and elsewhere, uh, that certainly the Shia majority has more to gain from uh, a, a more democratic system uh, there uh, than, the, than the Sunni minority, but I think the sectarian uh, aspects of the struggle have been um, overblown, you know, largely uh, by supporters of the um, regime. Um, some of the earlier struggles back in the 80s you know, had more you know, Iranian support and the Iranian revolution initially caught the interest of some uh, Bahrainis, but, um, but uh, you know, since the, given the direction the Iranian revolution has taken, they, um, it's alienated you know, most Bahrainis uh, as it has most Iranians <laughs> uh, at this point. Um, so I, but, but I think you know, the concern about uh, um, you know, about you know, the sectarian and, and Iranian uh, connection in, in Bahrain in particular has, has made the U.S. reticent from being more supportive of, 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 um, of reform there. Um, you know, those of you who've been to Manama, uh, just looking at the U.S. Embassy, I mean, I think relative to the size of the country, it's probably about the largest U.S. Embassy <laughs> in the world, not to mention that the U.S. Navy controls about a fifth of the country. And, and you know, as, as the home of the Fifth Fleet, I remember you know, interviewing uh, Admiral Crow there some years ago, and he said, man for man, pound for pound, the Bahrainis are the greatest ally the U.S. has. And, you know, um, so there's that, that whole um, you know, strategic uh, orient, orientation. But, uh, you know, I, I'm afraid you know, we risk you know, being on the wrong side of history again if, we, if, if we're not uh, you know, more supportive of, um, of, of um, you know, pro-democracy movements, uh, wherever they may be. You've been waiting very patiently. If you keep your hands up, I'll... Please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think the U.S. and Western institutions should play up or downplay any possible role or influence on the movements in order to make the, the movements appeal more to the Middle Eastern people or to oppose Al-Qaeda? Um, I think just, just to... Given the history of U.S. intervention in the Middle East, and given the U.S. history of propping up dictators and that kind of thing, I, I, I think you know, you know, um, you know, my, it'd probably be cautious to um, you know, keep some distance and 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 allow the you know peoples of the, of those countries to uh, determine their own future. I think the main thing would be the, the whole, whole, whole dictum of do, first do no harm, <laughs> and that is to um, you know, to stop 
propping up you know, some of these, um, these regimes. I think in terms of, uh, I mean, I, I, think we all, I think it's safe to say that a more democratic Middle East, w you know, would be, you know, the nature of democracy is you, you know, listen more to the aspirations of your people. And so these uh, more democratic governments would probably be more nationalist. They would probably uh, find, there'd be probably more disagreements with the U.S. on certain policy issues than, than, than uh, uh, friendly dictators. Um, I think they'd be less likely to follow the dictates of the IMF and other international financial institutions. But I think in the long term, it would be one of the best things for uh, U.S. Uh, security. And I would add Israeli security as well. Because, um, you know, the, um, uh, um, a, uh, one, you know, you know, the fact is, is that people are far more likely to embrace extremist ideologies and uh, support terrorism if they feel hopeless in terms of working for change and addressing their political grievances through um, you know, nonviolent legal means. And if people feel they can, they can create change um, you know, th um, through a democratic uh, you know, process, uh, they are much less prone to embrace these kind of ideologies. So I think in the long term, uh, though there could be setbacks in certain you know, policies, I think it's very much in the interest of the United States uh, to welcome uh, nonviolent uh, change. And um, you know, when it comes to, to um, Israel, I think that uh, you know, the, the, I think a more democratic Egypt, for example, would not renounce the uh, Camp David agreement or make war with Israel because you know, they tried that four times before and <laughs> uh, you know, got their butts kicked. And, um, but I think we, we, you would see a relief of some of the, um, the blockade of Gaza, at least in terms of humanitarian goods. I think you'd see more pressure around the settlements. I think you'd see more you know, um, um, you know, pressure on the United States to be more of an honest broker. But as far as I'm concerned, that's what needs to happen anyway <laughs> in terms of... Uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace, which I think, again, is ultimately good for Israel. Um, uh, for those of us who still hold out, for the, the, the shrinking number of us who still think there's hope for a two-state solution. Um, so I'm, I'm, um, I, I, I'm not, not, not sure if this is, is answering your question, but I, I think um, uh, it's you know, very much in the interest of the U.S. to, to be supportive of these, these uh, pro-democracy movements. But... Uh, and not, but it's not, not our role to lead by any means. Uh, my question was about uh, would your concept of democracy, or what would, what do you envision democracy in North Africa to be? Because I think there is a general feeling that it's going to be something different from what we have in the United States, and so. Um, the actual foreign democracy takes place, I think, does, uh, you know, does depend on a country's cultural, unique cultural and historical experiences. But uh, you know, I'm, at the same time, I think the desire for accountable government is universal. I believe that uh, Arabs and Muslims don't like being jailed, tortured, and murdered for their political beliefs any more than Western Christians do. I think you know, there's certain. Uh, you know, I think the desire for freedom and, and social and economic justice is something that is universal. And while liberal democracy is, you know, not uh, the be-all and end-all of a just system, uh, allowing civic space uh, makes it possible for workers, for women, for. Uh, other, you know, other you know, groups that have, you know, real uh, interest to, to, to mobilize, you know, their, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, mobilize, uh, you know, their, their supporters without having fear of the secret police coming in, in the middle of the night and hauling people away. Um, and so I think uh, um, allowing that kind of, you know, civic space uh, is, is, um, is critical. And that, at that point, you know, people can you know, then work and, and for uh, you know, a, a more, more truly democratic system. 
I think that uh, you know certainly uh, the um, um, milit- you know that, that uh, we still have a ways to go in Tunisia and Egypt for the real democracy, of course. But uh, there's a um, but the people have been empowered to uh, to an unprecedented degree, and and uh, this is not just an anti Mubarak movement or an anti Ben Ali movement. These were pro democracy movements. So I, I think we're gonna we've already seen a couple of prime ministers dumped. We're seeing uh, you know um, you know some pretty serious you know uh, challenges. Uh, the military realizes that people aren't going to accept. Okay, we're in charge now. Everything's cool. Go home. Um, you know, that we'll be seeing more people on the streets, um, and I, I think that's I think that's healthy. Um, we're seeing labor <laughs> organized to, to you know, and, and, and striking to to an unprecedented degree, and as long as things don't get totally chaotic and, and crazy, um, I think uh, you know uh, some degree of disruption is, is actually healthy for uh, for a democratic uh, you know, uh, process to make sure that the uh, transition to a, to a more democratic order is is, is real. There were two hands in the back. Uh, two gentlemen in the back. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. What do you think the impact of the use of private military um, personnel would be having in the Libyan conflicts mm-hmm. more specifically? But just in general, like the, the potential that that could have in the in the in the face of nonviolence in, mm-hmm. in, the, in the kind of the yeah. future, because it seems that the, one of the biggest t- turning points is whenever the military are are co-opted in one way or another. So if it's private military, that's what their job is. I'm curious what you think that interaction. And one of the um, some of the problems with the Rantier state, where you can afford to bring in mercenaries, and that may be, you know, less prone to um, uh, or, uh, might have 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 um, less problems with, with with shooting into a crowd than people might have with, with their own, own fellow fellow citizens. But even there, I mean, I think there are limits to what some people are willing to do. Um, another problem is, is what, what we've seen uh, is that um, people realize that shooting into crowds, you know, uniformed you know, um, police or military shooting into crowds can create a kind of reaction. What we, we saw um, being um, used in, in Egypt, what we've been seeing in Yemen, a few other cases, is just getting kind of freelance thugs, either, you know, plainclothes policemen or people that are hired or whatever, to do do the dirty work and 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 then the and then the police and military oh we're just trying to restore order from the two extremes uh, indeed the the nonviolent the massive nonviolent movement in El Salvador in something nine eighty you know was 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 crushed in large part because you got these um, uh, you know death squads that you know tried to feign that they are separate from the government and Duarte and these guys oh we're just caught between the extreme right and extreme left and um, and, and so, in many ways, the privatization of the repressive apparatus or the decentralization of the um, repressive apparatus is another uh, real, real obstacle uh, that, this, uh, that can um, and par- partly nullify the political jujitsu effect that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. But, uh, but at the same time, it's been, it was impressive to, to see how the Egyptians withstood you know, this kind of attacks and, and helped expose you know, the origins of these, um, of these attackers. Um, you know, one uh, another, you know, people have been um, able to uh, you know mobilize in other ways of um, of um, uh, you know through um, uh, you know third party nonviolent intervention, you know through um, you know other other kinds of um, uh, you know mobilizing uh, self defense committees and the like. You know, so so you know, these sorts of things make it more difficult, but but not not impossible. record of uh, uh, strategic nonviolent uprisings uh, in toppling dictators, authoritarian regimes uh, uh, is very, it's very clear. It's very, uh, evidence, historical evidence just keeps accumulating. Um, my question is about a different context. Uh, uh, in the context of uh, ethnic conflict, in which uh, two, two or more groups uh, you know, live in a disputed territory. Uh, the numbers are relatively, relatively even. Uh, there's a history of violence. 
uh, there's some very widespread dehumanization of the other group, uh, such as in Palestine, such as Kashmir, such as Sri Lanka, or Cyprus, or other uh, North, Northern Europe, I think would be another example of that. Um, are there examples? I, I, I want there to be. Uh, and uh, if there aren't, it doesn't mean that it can happen. Yeah. But could you speak to that, whether that situation is more difficult uh, for not, for nonviolent action, or I might say it another way: Does it set the bar high? Mm -hmm. Meaning, do you really need principled nonviolent action in which one side really isn't engaging in low low level violence or threatening mm -hmm. rhetoric or you know, but really sort of uh, powerfully nonviolent messaging to somehow break through uh, this higher bar of mm -hmm. distrust? It does make it more difficult, but uh, not impossible. Uh, we, we've seen in, um, in, in, in periodically if there's been um, communal violence in India, for example, and this goes back to um, you know the uh, when Gandhi was still alive. But we, we see it more recently that they they do do have this third party intervention of uh, you know mixed groups of Muslims and Christians, they're physically getting between the two groups uh, to try to try to stop the um, stop the fighting. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, and other um, <clears throat> as well as um, um, efforts to sort of you know expose how you know often you know communal violence is, is deliberately manipulated you know by you know, certain people and 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 authority you know, to um, um, as as a, as a form of uh, of divide and rule. You know, one of the you know obstacles in Western Sahara is that the uh, Moroccan settlers now uh, outnumber the indigenous Sahrawis inside the um, occupied territory. Uh, but you know, even there, they've been gradually winning over you know people in large part because more and more Moroccans don't like the monarchy and some of the things that they're doing. Um, in some Moroccan universities, you have uh, Sahrawi students who are getting involved among some of the. Um, Moroccan human rights groups and say, you know, you know how you're upset about the government because of this and this and this? Guess what? They've been lying to you about Western Sahara too. Um, East Timorese students uh, were actually quite successful in, East, in, in, in Indonesia in terms of you know, raising awareness among Javanese and others about the reality of, uh, of the uh, East Timor situation. So we're starting to see a little bit of that. Not, not a lot yet, but the beginnings of that in, in um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Morocco and, and um, um, and Western Sahara, even during the uh, some of the worst you know violence in in, in the Lebanese civil war, you had um, a Christian and, and, and Muslim women who did a joint march across the Green Line, uh, dividing uh, you know, Beirut, and of course the, the peace women in Ireland, um, um, Mairead McGuire, who's now very actually very active in Palestine solidarity among other things. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and her Protestant counterpart, I forgot her name, uh, uh, somebody Williams, um, you know, they won the Nobel Peace Prize you know, for, for their effort, you know, uh, back in the um, uh, late 19, 1970s. Uh, you know, so, so, so it's, it's definitely a challenging one, but there have been, you know, uh, some uh, examples of, um, of, um, of what, what can be done. I, another example would be um, uh, some of the efforts in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, back when there was that horrific you know, you know, violence uh, you know, going on between the Zulus and, and, and others, and during the the Kata Freedom Party and ANC you know, people of of uh, you know, forms and, and some attacks against the ethnic Indian population. You know, there was you know uh, you know there was um, joint efforts to not violently intercede as well. So we have time for a couple more questions, you sir. Just my question is related to the comment that. Well, the print, uh, from the print of the uh, situation, uh, I think it was in Tunisia, mm -hmm. they said that they need to liberalize their uh, economy first. Don't you sort of see the other way around in these our countries that people have to liberalize their pre-sub regime first before liberalizing their, their economy? I mean, I mean, I think whether it's a capitalist economy or more socialist economy, if the government is, is, is unaccountable, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> that. Uh, you need transparency for um, um, you know, for for an economy to meet the needs of the people. Otherwise, you're going to have you're, you're going to get ripped off, whether it be by corrupt bureaucrats or or corrupt business people or a combination of both. I mean, my own 
I, I tend to be a critic of, of neoliberalism. I, I tend to, um, um, you know, my, my vision on economic issues it tends to be on the left, but, but uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the, 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 um, well, you know, wherever one sits on that, that spectrum, I think the, the, the bottom line is, um, is the need for uh, you know, transparency and, and, and accountability you know, by by a, a government and its institutions, including regulatory um, institutions. Um, you know, Peter Ackerman, who is the uh, one, uh, the, one, the co-founder of the uh, International Center on Nonviolent uh, you know, uh, Conflict, is um, and who I w uh, worked with on occasion. I mean, he's he's kind of a libertarian. I mean, so he's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum on economic issues than I am. But we both recognize that you know the, the, to have you know a, you know political. Having a political freedom and, and, and transparency is is, is 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 critical because you really do need to have that in order um, you know, for any kind of economic system to have any hope of um, of, of functioning in, uh, in in a in a productive in a productive way. Great. Last question. So my question is kind of a follow up on the question that I asked before about uh, about uh, conflicts with. Kind of like I, I want to talk about Israel and Palestine in particular, mm -hmm. and why the uh, why we haven't seen a more successful nonviolence resistance movement there. Um, it seems to me it's because you know there there is less accountability in terms of you know an Israeli soldier pointing a gun to a crowd of Palestinians is less hesitant to shoot, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of accounts of that. Sure. Um, so I want to hear your and again like about trying to get international accountability. Um, we've just seen in the last couple of weeks that like, uh, Palestine is trying to get recognized as its own sovereign state, and the US is saying that's not going to work. Where, where does all of that lead? It seems like they're kind of in a crux where violent, violent, uh, violent opposition is definitely not going to work, mm -hmm. as we've seen from Gaza, and oh, sure. nonviolent yeah. also hasn't really worked. Uh, it's it's um, I mean you know there is the demonization of the other uh, and, and the very uh, you, know, you know racist and chauvinistic tendencies you've seen on the rise in Israel have have been a serious um, um, a serious obstacle. The other whole nature is that uh, in, in many ways Oslo ended up being a trap in that uh, it, you know nonviolent resistance was easier when the Israelis had were in, in charge of the whole area. But by controlling most of the land, but not most of the people, <laughs> it makes uh, you know many of the classic tactics of, uh, uh, of nonviolent struggle uh, more more difficult. Um, I think that um, you know there we were certainly we, we have seen a number of rather anybody seen the film Berlin? And that, I mean that's really I highly recommend this a remarkable story of uh, of success um, of um, of of um, of nonviolent of nonviolent um, non struggle, um, and, and, and and at least in, in several places where people successfully you know, rerouted uh, rerouted the wall because of, um, of, of of persistent nonviolent resistance, which in many cases included internationals and and Israelis. Um, then that you know that's one way of, of helping the situation actually is given the racism uh, and the like is is to internationalize it. But kind of going back to what I referred to earlier, I think the most critical issue here in the United States uh, anyway is to um, 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 do what we did vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam, Central America, East Timor, et cetera, and uh, you know press our government to stop supporting instruments of repression. And uh, and, uh, and and hold our, our, our political figures uh, accountable, um, and you know. So I think in many ways the the um, uh, I, I think there I I have some mixed feelings about certain aspects of it, but I think on balance the um, BDS movement is is a positive um, um, is positive. That's you know boycott divestment sanctions uh, um, um, effort. So I, you know, I think uh, in these kind of situations, uh, as as we we've, we've seen in cases like East Timor and Namibia, to take you know, two examples of occupied territories where you know there was um, you know uh, both armed and and and, and nonviolent uh, resistance within the territories, but they were 
and seemingly in a pretty hopeless situation until international solidarity you know, mobilized and, and just made it politically impossible for the occupations to, um, to continue because the outside support for the occupation became politically untenable. I think that's really what we need to um, um, you know, focus on uh, you know, vis-a-vis Palestine as well. Um, is, but that seems, I mean, like, the U.S. is very, like, they, they don't seem to, the U.S. doesn't seem to really want to part with Israel at all. Uh, I mean, it seems even, uh, even Obama, who said he was going to maybe be a little bit harsher with Israel, it hasn't happened. And in terms of bullying, and I mean, there are other protests like Billy and Lady Nani and the other mm-hmm. the others and they all have to go through the Israeli Supreme Court before anything is done. Mm-hmm. So like that's not a reliable system either. Oh no 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 not at all. But, but um, judiciary is like you know are ultimately uh, politically malleable uh, if you have the have the kind of a uh, kind of uh, a movement and and I think I mean I think part of it is just that I've I've um you know uh, you know, East Timor, you know, was, was sort of the hopeless cause nobody had heard of. How are we going to stop the Australians and British and Americans from supporting Indonesia in this regard? Indonesia is such an important ally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That shifted, you know, um, and I, you know, I've, I've certainly seen in, um, in, you know, in South Africa, given the pro- incredible corporate profits made possible, you know, by this great combination of, uh, of third world labor force and first world, you know, consumers. And yet they were able to overcome um, overcome that, you know, through the um, uh, you know th- through uh, international you know solidarity and and uh, which often in- included a fair amount of, of uh, strategic nonviolent action, you know, in the uh, advanced industrialized countries that were backing the system. That's one of the, one of the, a number of exciting things about the you know, new media that I was talking about earlier that uh, you can you know. <laughs> That that's kind of international networking and and, and solidarity uh, is is, um, is is easier to organize. Um, you you have you capture on film. You know the repression was being made possible through our tax dollars or whatever, and so that is that, that also ends up being um, a um, um, a means of, of mobilizing the kind of um, uh, international support that's. Uh, that's necessary when you have an occupation type situation. Thank you, Professor Zunis, and thank you all. Mm-hmm.